Have you heard of an herb and just thought it was something you put in your food to add flavor? There are two types of plant bodies that will be referred to. The primary plant body is herbaceous, while the secondary plant body is woody. Both this geranium and iris is considered an herb since it produces wood or bark. Geranium is a broadleaf plant or eudicot, and the iris is a monocot with grass-like leaves. Our annual plants, plants that only live one year, are always herbaceous. I'm Dr. DeBusk, and in this video, I'll be talking about the primary tissues found in plants, as well as the external and internal organization of stems. A shoot is a stem with included leaves. Leaves are attached at nodes. Inner nodes are the region between the nodes. The stem area just above the point where the leaf attaches is the leaf axle. It contains an axillary bud, a miniature shoot with a dormant apical meristem and several young leaves. Although the axle of every leaf contains a bud, only a few buds ever develop into a branch. Others remain dormant or produce flowers. For most plants, most axillary buds are not needed as long as the apical meristem is healthy. If the apical meristem is killed, axillary buds become active and replace it. At the extreme tip of the stem is a terminal bud. Phyllotaxy is the arrangement of the leaves on the stem. It is so they do not shade each other. There's alternate phyllotaxy, or one leaf per node, opposite phyllotaxy, or two leaves per node, or world phyllotaxy, or more than two leaves per node. The stems of some plants are modified. Stolons have especially long and thin inner nodes, allowing dispersal of daughter plants, like the runners of strawberries. Nutrient storage is important in some shoots. Bulbs are short shoots that have thick fleshy leaves like onions. Corms are vertical thick stems that have thin papery leaves. Rhizomes are fleshy horizontal stems that allow a plant to spread underground like ginger or turmeric. Tubers are horizontal like rhizomes, but they grow only for a short period and are mainly a means of storing nutrients, like potatoes. The epidermis is the outermost surface of an herbaceous stem. It is a single layer of parenchyma cells. All interchange of material between a plant and its environment occurs by means of its epidermis. It functions in protection and, and preventing water loss. The outer walls are coated with waterproof cutin. It builds up as a layer called the cuticle. Under dry conditions, a wax layer may be added to the cuticle. The cuticle prevents desiccation, but it also prevents gas exchange. This critical function is accomplished by stomata. Guard cells make up this opening and swell by absorbing water. The pore between them opens, allowing carbon dioxide to go in and out. Water is lost through the stomata. Guard cells regulate when the pores are opened and closed. They remain closed after sunset and during periods of water stress. Some epidermal cells elongate outward and become trichomes, hairs. Trichomes can make it difficult for an animal to land on, walk on, or chew into a leaf. These gland-tipped sundews have a sticky substance that traps an insect for digestion. Trichomes can shade underlying tissues by blocking some incoming sunlight, which may be too intense in summer, such as this lamb ear plant. They also create an immobile air next to the leaf surface allowing water molecules that diffuse out of a stoma to bounce back rather than be swept away by air currents. Further in from the epidermis is the cortex. It often has photosynthetic parenchyma and sometimes calenchyma. In other species, it may have specialized cells that secrete latex, mucilage, or resin. Cells are tightly fitted, but some plants have a cortex of aranchyma loosely packed with large intercellular air spaces, such as this water lily. This allows the plant to be able to float. Vascular tissues are responsible for the conduction of materials throughout the plant. There are two types of vascular tissues that occur in plants. Xylem conducts water and minerals. Phloem distributes sugars and minerals. Xylem is dead and hollow at maturity, while phloem remains alive at maturity. I always remember these by thinking that phloem transports food. Xylem consists of tracheids and vessel elements. Collectively, they are referred to as tracheary elements. 
The strength of the cells is due to the secondary cell walls. The strongest tracheary elements have circular bordered pits. The pits are where the water flows out of the next cell and are weak points in the wall. This weakness is reduced by a border of extra wall material. Water moves between tracheids through pit membranes. Vessel elements provide a way to move water with less friction. Perforations or slits form between vertically stacked vessel elements. A stack of vessel elements is called a vessel. All plants with vascular tissues have tracheids. Conifers only have tracheids. They are also found in leaf veins of flowering plants. Only flowering plants have vessel elements. They perform long distance water conduction in roots and stems. Phloem has two types of conducting cells, sieve cells and sieve tube members. The term sieve element refers to either. They develop from parenchyma cells that remain alive. Plasma desmata enlarge to become sieve pores. The sieve pores aggregate in sieve areas. A sieve cell is similar in shape to a tracheid. It is elongated and tapered. Sieve areas are distributed all over its surface. This type is found in older fossils and in non-flowering vascular plants. Sieve tube members are similar to the vessel members of the xylem. Sieve plates are on each end wall. They align vertically to form a sieve tube. This allows for more effective flow of sap. All angiosperms have sieve tubes. None of the non-angiosperms have them. The nuclei of sieve elements degenerate. No complex metabolism occurs without the nucleus, so sieve elements are associated with neighboring cells that exert nuclear control or are the brain of the combo. Sieve cells are associated with albuminous cells and sieve tube members are controlled by companion cells. Companion cells are involved in sugar loading into sieve tubes. They're often smaller than the accompanying conducting cell. They have a prominent nucleus and dense cytoplasm filled with ribosomes. Xylem and phloem occur together in vascular bundles, interior to the cortex. Their arrangement of the bundles differ between monocots and other angiosperms. Each bundle includes xylem and flowing running parallel to each other with the phloem closer to the epidermis. In eudicots, vascular bundles are arranged in a ring surrounding the pith. The pith is a central region of parenchyma sim similar to the cortex. In monocots, they are distributed as a complex network throughout the inner part of the stem. The xylem of a vascular bundle is primary xylem. In addition to the tracheary elements, there are a large portion of xylem parenchyma and xylem fibers. The phloem of a vascular bundle is the primary phloem. In addition to the sieve elements and their associate cells, there are storage parenchyma and phloem fibers or sclerids. Stems grow longer by creating new cells at their tips at regions known as apical meristems. The cells here retain their ability to, to divide. The expanding daughter cells push the apical meristem upward. Subapical meristems contain cells dividing and growing, producing cells for the region below. In the subapical meristem, differentiation begins at, as some cells stop dividing. The protoderm is epidermal cells that are in early stages of differentiation. Young xylem and phloem cells are provascular tissues or procambium. The equivalent stages of pith and cortex are ground meristem. Primary growth is the growth and tissue formation that results from apical meristem activity. You can see how the primary growth is organized in this concept map. I hope you learned a bit more about the external and internal organizations of stems. You will find that these same primary tissues will be found throughout the plant.